this is BBC World News. I'm Karen Ginoni. Our top stories. <laughs> Return of the Dragon. America's first commercial astronaut capsule splashes back down to Earth after a successful test mission to the International Space Station. Markets fall in the US as new figures show the economy has created the lowest number of jobs for a year and a half, coming well below forecasts. Three weeks to Brexit, and Theresa May appeals to MPs to back her deal in Parliament next week. She says it needs one more push. Reject it, and no one knows what will happen. We may not leave the EU for many months. And we speak to three Chinese women about empowerment, relationships and freedom as we mark International Women's Day. Hello, welcome to BBC World News. A moment of space history has been made. America's first commercial astronaut capsule has successfully completed its demonstration flight splashing down in the Atlantic in the past couple of hours. Let's show you the moment the spacecraft built by SpaceX landed on the ocean where a recovery vessel was waiting. And there we have confirmation of splashdown. You can hear the joy. Another piece of history as well. This is the first time in 50 years, almost to the day, a capsule designed for humans actually landed in the Atlantic Ocean. The last time anyone saw that live was the Apollo 9 landing in 1969. Retro rockets had slowed the Dragon down to take it through the atmosphere after undocking from the International Space Station earlier. With me to talk about this more, Rebecca Morrell, our BBC science correspondent. Rebecca, was it a textbook landing? Oh, it did look quite good, didn't it, actually? I mean, those when you think about the journey that this capsule has been on, you know, last Saturday it took off on the Falcon 9, it spent several days on the space station, and then the process of re-entry is really, really hard, actually. It has to endure temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius as it goes through the Earth's atmosphere. It's going incredibly fast, 30,000 kilometres an hour. And then, you know, the pictures we see of it sort of deploying those parachutes and just gently splashing down into the ocean, you know, it makes it all look very easy, but it did look good. And they've just recovered the capsule, so, so now will be the key time, because they'll be wanting to test its performance and also to take a look inside because there was a, a test dummy in there. I was going to ask you who the passenger was. Yes, Ripley, its <laughs> name is. Ripley, not a real person, just a test dummy. Um, but it's covered in sensors and the idea is to sort of see what kind of experience an astronaut would have were they to have been on this mission. So they'll be looking really carefully at that data to see, see how it fared. And if it is decided that it is all systems go, what is the next step? Well, in the next few weeks, it's going to do its second test, which is quite an interesting one. It's an emergency abort procedure. So basically, um, the rocket will go up, the capsule is on the rocket, and then a command will be sent through, and you'll see the capsule being jettisoned off with its rockets. And that's really important, because if there's a failure on the runway or just minutes into launch, it's important that any astronauts could get away safely. If that goes to plan, then in July or August, then we should see two astronauts um, heading up to the International Space Station on the Dragon capsule. And this is remarkable, not only because this is a collaboration with a commercial company, but also since 2011, America hasn't been able to put its own astronauts in space. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, really, when you think of this great space-going nation. You know, since the retirement of the Space Shuttle, which was on safety grounds because of the two catastrophes they had, but also on price, they've had no way of getting their astronauts up to the space station, which they also have a tremendous stake in. They've had to actually buy seats on the Russian Soyuz system. So this really marks a change for them. But I think it is interesting, this tie-in with a commercial company, because until now, everything was built by NASA, designed by NASA, you know, controlled by NASA. And this is a very different prospect. Rebecca, we're out of time. Thanks very much, Rebecca. We're out. Now, there's been some bad news for the US economy with a sharp decline in jobs growth. Just 20,000 new jobs were created last month. That's a fraction of the 180,000 expected. US markets have fallen off the back of that news. But speaking just a short while ago, President Trump insisted things are looking up for the US economy. Well, the economy is doing very well. Uh, we're seeing wages rise more than they have at any time for a long, long time. Wages are going up, first time for many years, 
I talked about it during the campaign for over 20 years, so I'm happy about that. The economy is very, very strong. Uh, if you look at the stock market over the last few months, it's been great. And certainly since my election, it's up getting close to 50 percent, the stock market. So we're obviously very happy with that. Uh, we will, I think, as soon as these trade deals are done, if they get done, and we're working with China, we'll see what happens. But I think you're going to see a very big spike. A lot of people are waiting to see what happens with the China deal. Mexico-Canada is done. We'll be submitting to Congress very shortly. And that's a great deal for the United States. So we're very happy about that. Well, President Trump has also spoken about his former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, a day after he was jailed for nearly four years for bank and tax fraud. The 69-year-old is one of six former aides of the president who've been indicted in the Mueller inquiry. Mr. Trump again hit out at that investigation. I feel very badly for Paul Manafort. Uh, I think it's been a very, very tough time for him. But if you notice, uh, both his lawyer a highly respected man and a very highly respected judge. The judge said there was no collusion with Russia. It's had nothing to do with collusion. There was no collusion. It's a collusion hoax. It's a collusion witch hoax. I don't collude with Russia. Now it's three weeks till the UK is due to leave the European Union and the British Prime Minister has warned that if Parliament rejects her Brexit deal again next week, the country risks not leaving the EU at all. Theresa May has also said the European Union needs to do more to deliver an acceptable deal so that she can get it through Parliament. Mrs May is trying to get the EU to agree to changes to the controversial Irish backstop, which is designed to prevent physical checks on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But so far, no luck and time is running out. European leaders tell me they worry that time is running out and that we only have one chance to get it right. My message to them is now is the moment for us to act. We've worked hard together over two years on the deal. It's a comprehensive deal that provides for an orderly exit from the EU and that sets a platform for an ambitious future relationship. It needs just one more push to address the final specific concerns of our parliament. So let's not hold back. Let's do what is necessary for MPs to back the deal on Tuesday. Because if MPs reject the deal, Nothing is certain. It would be at a moment of crisis. Well, let's speak to our UK political correspondent, Rob Watson. It's, well, we must do what is necessary. Who is she trying to appeal to there, Rob? I think she's trying to do two things. One, of course, is a dark warning, if you like, to those in her own governing Conservative Party who are very enthusiastic about Brexit but think her version of Brexit is going to be too soft and leave Britain too close to the EU. So basically, she's trying to frighten them into going for her deal. Otherwise, maybe uncertainty, no Brexit, second referendum. Her, I think the other part of her message is an appeal to EU leaders to do what they can to help in the last few minutes, seconds before the big vote. But I think it's also a, you know, an element of playing a blame game. She's almost anticipating defeat on Tuesday, the big vote, and saying, well, you know, in part, it'll be the fault of Brussels. And I think an awful lot of her critics will say that's rather unwise to have a sort of blame the nasty foreigners approach for her own domestic problems. Do we have any idea of what is going to be going on in the days over the weekend leading up to that vote on Tuesday? I can give you a very shrewd idea having spoken to a lot of Conservative politicians and Labour ones. That is, they'll be coming under huge pressure from everybody around Theresa May to try and think of these consequences of, of not going for her deal. So there'll be massive amounts of pressure, a lot of phone calls, a lot of promises, maybe the odd threat too. And if uh, it happens that she, the vote does not go her way on Tuesday, then where are we? What, what happens after that? Well, I think it's important to say that we don't know. I mean, those politicians I've spoken to in her sort of circle seem somewhat gloomy, but who knows? We'll have to wait and see. I mean, if it if it goes down, if her deal doesn't get through, first thing that's going to happen is MPs will be asked to vote on Wednesday on whether they will pre be prepared to leave the EU without any kind of deal at all, which seems hugely unlikely. And then on Thursday, so goodness, we're going to have a busy week. Thursday, the vote will be, should we ask the EU for a delay of some kind? 
Rob, I mean, just, just to put it into context, she needs a really to win huge numbers of, vote, of people over uh, to, to get through that vote on Tuesday. Yes, she does. And it's worth remembering, the last time she put this deal to a vote, she lost by a bigger margin than any government since this form of government has existed in this country since the 18th century. And I think another bad kind of portent for Theresa May, the last time that she went to one of these very kind of leave voting parts of the UK to make a, a big speech for, uh, for her deal was, guess what, before that last very big defeat. But, you know, who knows? These are very high stakes. Lots of pressure will be applied. So many questions in the air. Rob, thank you very much. Rob Watson. The British-Iranian woman Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, currently being held in prison in Iran, is to get diplomatic protection from the British government. It means her case will now be treated as a formal legal dispute between Britain and Iran. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, says it's an important diplomatic step towards securing her release, but not a magic wand. Our World Affairs correspondent, Caroline Hawley, reports. It's close to three years since Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe was arrested at Tehran airport as she was leaving for home with her young daughter. You can see the shock on her face. Last summer she was briefly released, only to be sent back to jail despite urgent pleas from the UK government and her family. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, seen here with her daughter Gabriella just before she was jailed, needs medical treatment that she's not being allowed. The Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt was in Iran late last year to push for her release. He says that the extremely rare step that the Foreign Office has taken today is a last resort, after all other avenues were exhausted. We think it's the first time diplomatic protection has been exercised for an individual for over 100 years. And for that reason, um, we think it sends a very, very strong signal that there is a human being here. We all need to think about this. It's not just about the diplomatic arguments there may be between the UK and Iran. There's a family here. Um, they need to be reunited. Her husband, Richard, who's campaigned tirelessly for her release, has welcomed the decision. It's one he'd been pushing the government to take really big step, um, you know, implicitly, explicitly. What that means is, is asserting that she is British, not just a dual national, but, but fundamentally she's a British citizen, and also asserting that actually she suffered a huge injustice. Um, this is an innocent person being held in prison for leverage over the UK. It's, it's outrageous. But Iran has reacted with anger. Its ambassador to the UK said Britain's decision contravened international law, that Iran didn't recognise dual nationality and was treating Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe as an Iranian. What impact the decision will have on her, nobody yet knows. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, stay with us here on BBC World News. Still to come, an escalation between Chinese telecom giant Huawei and the US. China now says it will support the company's lawsuit against the Trump administration. The numbers of dead and wounded defied belief. This, the worst terrorist atrocity on European soil in modern times. In less than 24 hours then, the Soviet Union lost an elderly sick leader and replaced him with a dynamic figure, 20 years his junior. We heard these gunshots in the gym. Then he came out through a fire exit and started firing at our huts and got we all petrified. James Earl Ray, aged 41, sentenced to 99 years, and due for parole when he's 90, travelled from Memphis jail to Nashville State Prison in an eight-car convoy. Paul, what's it feel like to be married at last? It feels fine, thank you. What are you going to do now? Is it going to change your life much, do you think? I don't know, really. I've never been married before. <laughs> You're watching BBC World News with me, Karen Ginoni. Our latest headlines. SpaceX Dragon, the privately owned commercial astronaut capsule, has ended its first mission. The unmanned craft undocked from the International Space Station and splashed down in the Atlantic. US markets have fallen. Off the back of some bad news for the economy, there's been a sharp decline in jobs growth. Just 20,000 new jobs were created last month, a fraction of the 180,000 expected.
China says it will support the lawsuit launched by telecoms giant Huawei against the US government in response to Washington's attempts to limit Huawei's American reach. The US and others fear that China's using Huawei as a proxy so it can spy on rival nations. China's foreign minister, speaking on the sidelines of the annual National People's Congress, acknowledged his government's backing of Huawei in this lawsuit is a deliberate political move. Our China correspondent Stephen McDonnell is outside the Great Hall of the People and sends this report. When pronouncements are made here at the National People's Congress, people pay attention, especially when it comes from the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. And the press conferences, which are held on the sidelines of this major political event, are highly controlled. When it comes to the main ones, all the questions are vetted. So, when Foreign Minister Wang Yi gets asked about Huawei, and specifically about the extradition proceedings against its executive, Meng Wanzhou, he wants to be asked about it. And he wants to put out a message for Canada and the United States. And that message was that this government has no choice but to support Huawei and Meng Wanzhou, who he said would not be victimized like silent lambs. He said any impartial observer would recognize this wasn't a normal case, that this was a highly political move from Canada and the United States. He said people recognized right from wrong and that eventually Meng Wanzhou would have justice. What's more, he added that China wasn't just going into bat for Huawei in order to support that company, but actually for all countries, especially those who had high tech companies who supported free trade. So in a way, he's taking the high moral ground here, saying China is a multilateral player supporting free trade. The obvious comparison he's drawing is with Washington, I suppose, the implication being that they are not. You know, in just a few weeks' time, we're led to believe there have been preparations for a meeting between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. It's hard to believe when this message is being delivered at the National People's Congress today that China and the United States could easily get through the trade negotiations which are needed to break the trade war. And yet, there we have it. This is a very deliberate message from the Chinese Foreign Minister today. Stephen McDonnell in Beijing. Well, staying in China, where along with the rest of the world, International Women's Day is being celebrated. The 8th of March has been a national holiday there since 1949. The BBC spoke to three women about what it means to be a woman in modern China. I'd rather to do my own thing and to enjoy my own life. I hope all Chinese women can learn to enjoy the pleasures of sex. I have no interest in having a baby. The main stereotype of girls in China is that you are ready to get married at second. It's kind of normal if you go to college, but don't go too far. Like if you ended up studying PhD, people would say like, oh, you will be an old virgin. No one will marry you because you're too intelligent, too knowledgeable. This is in Luang Prabang, in Laos. And this is a picture I took in Pyongyang, North Korea. A female solo traveler in China, especially for a lot of men, is not acceptable. Some people would comment it on my blog are saying like, oh, if a girl traveling around the world by herself, she's just a human sofa because everyone is sitting on her. I want to be who I am, not to be what the society want me to be. My company is the first online sex resource for women in China and we teach them how to enjoy their sexual relationships. China's sex education makes people here think sex is vulgar. There is barely any reliable sex information here for adults and I want my company to fill that void. The first thing we teach is that women's bodies are their own. You should study it, use it and learn how to pleasure yourself. Some have said that we've opened a new world for them, that we are like a beacon of light and given women their confidence.
The situation in China is that your mother and mother-in-law will say, "Women must have children." Such stereotypes are objectifying us to be like machines. A woman's value should not lie in giving birth. Currently, it's a prime time for my career. I never want to have a baby, not now or in the future. I'm considering having an endometrial ablation. It's a very good way to avoid getting pregnant. I also hope a future partner would consider a vasectomy. The perspectives of three women in China. Now, Namibia is one of the best places in the world to be a woman. That's according to the World Economic Forum, which ranks it 10th in terms of closing the gender gap. Monica Gaingos is an investment manager, a lawyer, and an entrepreneur. She's also the country's first lady, but that's not something she wants young women and girls to have as their ambition. She told Labour Diseko why. They mustn't aspire to become somebody through marriage. They must aspire to become somebody through the choices they make about what they want to study, the kind of work that they want to do, um, and the kind of impact that they want to make in the space that they occupy. So I always ask them, please, aspire to be a president, not a first lady. I was reading that there uh, is uh, one uh, advocacy group, uh, number one, that says that it'll take 108 years to reach global gender parity. I think we, we're getting close because of uh, quotas. And it's as simple as that, that if for as long as it's not um, put into some kind of regulatory framework on its own, it's not going to be very quick. Um, but where I also see a shift happening in Namibia is that we sitting with graduation rates of girls at higher rates than boys. So in about 10, 15 years time, countries like Namibia are going to have an imbalance. And there's then we can only choose female leaders because the pipeline is only is full of women. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, where are the boys? And I can tell you where the boys in Namibia are starting to go to. They're starting to end up in jail. They're starting to end up doing all kinds of things that um, are, are socially destructive. So it's, it's, it's a constant discussion. It's not a once off that we've got this quota now, wonderful, wonderful, let's move along, we've ticked the boxes. It's about the substance. What does it actually mean from a societal perspective? Are we preparing our families? Are we preparing our sons? Are we preparing our husbands to understand how these dynamics have changed and how that translates um, in the real sense? Those societal shifts, changing those patriarchal attitudes, how do we do that? So this is the challenge with patriarchal attitudes and the social shifts. These are things that happen primarily in the private space, um, in the private realm, and it's difficult to regulate that. Um, and you see it, um, high levels of gender-based violence. Um, you see men who beat their wives and don't really see a problem with that. You see women who are emotionally or financially abused who look down on unmarried women or on, on women who get beaten. So it's no difference if my husband psychologically abuses me and I look down on my neighbor who's being beaten by her husband. I'm also suffering gender-based violence. Namibia's First Lady speaking to Labour Di Secco. Now, in the last hour, we've had reports that the baby of Shamima Begum, the teenager who fled the UK to join the Islamic State group, has died. Now, we've been unable to independently verify those reports, but the family's lawyer says he has strong but unconfirmed reports that her two-week-old son has died. However, that's been countered by other BBC sources on the ground. Let's uh, talk now to our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford. Uh, Daniel, what, what are we hearing? What, what do we know? I think the first thing to say is that the only thing that's certain is that we don't know. Um, the family's lawyer, Mohammed Tasmina Kunji, who's represented Shamima Begum's family here in the UK for four years, went on to Twitter, said that he'd had these strong, unconfirmed reports that, uh, that Shamima Begum's newborn baby had died. Uh, we've uh, spoken to some people involved in looking after women and children in the camp, and one of those people said that they'd also heard the same thing. Uh, but then the SDF spokesman, the, spoke, the official spokesman for the forces that are fighting uh, the Islamic State group in the area uh, was, went on to Twitter also and categorically said that that was a fake report and that the baby was healthy and well. And these two uh, reports completely contradict 
each other. I've since seen the lawyer for the family uh, approaching the SDF spokesman on social media saying, listen, can you please get in touch? I'd like to try and get some confirmation of the truth. So um, I, I think it'll take a while for clarity to emerge, but uh, either someone's falsely told the family lawyer uh, that the baby has died, um, or the baby has indeed died, and I think it'll take us a while just to get to the bottom of that. Okay, Daniel, thanks very much, uh, Daniel Sanford, for telling us what we do know about uh, that situation with Shamima Vegan's baby. Thanks very much for watching BBC World News. I'll be back in a few minutes' time with the headlines. Stay with us.